Good morning and welcome everyone to the post in C one four that we can discourage with only our second lecture. Um, let's pray and let's start. So the we um are talking about us being tripart beings spirit, soul and body, each of them as as people and uh, just as we spend time and effort in developing our body or mind, uh, this course is to help us look at what the Bible teaches on developing our spirit, right? spiritual self. And uh, so, uh, now, for example, you know, we, uh, we are aware of um, people who practice, you know, black magic, all those things, they develop their spirit for the wrong reasons, right? To contact the powers of darkness, to do evil things on people. They use that power to harm, hurt, to control, right? so they do that. But we are learning from the book how to develop our spirit so that we can walk with God, that are as the sons of God. And how we can be instruments in God's hands to serve how we can help us. So uh, let's go to Romans chapter one. So we did some, uh, you know, some introduction last week. I'm, I'm not going to review all of that, but let's go to Romans chapter one. We'll pick up from there, and then we move forward. Romans. So uh, we mentioned, you know, and Jesus taught us in John four, verse twenty one. For that God is spirit. So if God is a spirit being, then the primary way that we are going to interact with God is spirit through his word. Because he is spirit, he made us spiritual beings. Yes, he put us with a mind and a body so that we can operate on earth. But he made us spiritual beings to be with us. God is spirit. We are also spiritual beings to relate to him. Spirit. Romans chapter 1, verse 9, so we pray like this. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Okay, so that loose connection. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, is the audio better now? Must be better, I think. Okay, 
All right, sorry about that. I didn't realize um, the audio was low. Okay, thank you. So just to quickly uh, recap, we, uh, we started by uh, mentioning John chapter 4, verses 21 on, where Jesus said, God is spirit, and uh, we must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is spirit. He created us primarily as spiritual beings. He gave us a soul and a body. The mind and the body helps us relate to this natural world. But the spirit, uh, he created us as spiritual beings so that we can relate to him. Right? So you and I are primarily spiritual beings. Right? And we relate to God who is spirit in our spirit. Now God can and, and he does touch us in our soul and in our body. Sometimes you can feel the presence of God. Or you have joy. And all, you know, experience that. All that is good. But the primary way we relate to God is in the spirit. Spirit to spirit. And we went to Romans chapter 1, verse 9. So let's go there. That's where we paused. Um, and hopefully the audio will be fine. So Romans chapter 1, verse 9, Paul is saying, I serve, uh, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. So our serving God is really a spiritual work. It's something that comes out of our spirit. Our worship of God and our service to God is a spiritual work. Right? So when we worship God, uh, we uh, you know when we praise Him, we worship Him. It must come from our spirit. When we are serving God, like when I'm okay, I'm now I'm speaking to you, or I am sharing the word, or I'm praying for people, whatever we do, our ministry, uh, service to God, or service to people. Is really something that comes out of my our spirit, right? So that means the condition of our spirit affects both our relationship with God and our service to people. So think about, and we will talk more about this in detail. But think about this: Jesus said, "Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God." That means my revelation of God is determined by the condition of my heart. Right? Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God. My revelation of God is determined by this, right? where my heart is. Jesus said, out of the heart comes all the evil thoughts and all the evil things that people do. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? Jesus said, out of the good deposit, good treasure of his heart, he brings forth good things. This is in Matthew 12. That means what I bring forth in my life, is determined by the condition of my heart. Because out of the deposit in my heart, I will bring forth good things or bad things. Right. So the condition of my heart also determines how I can serve, what happens in my life, how I serve people, all of that. So we need to learn how to develop a good, strong, healthy spirit in God. You with me so far? Yeah? OK. Now, I want to just share a thought. Uh, we're just calling it the stage of innocence, meaning um, we can't prove this. I mean, I mean, what, let me say this. Uh, there are not many scriptures on this particular subject or this topic. But I will just. Uh, share some insight, whatever we know. Okay, um, in uh, Hebrews chapter twelve, so uh, Hebrews twelve, um, he's he's talking to us about the fact that God is the Father. Of spirits, Hebrews 12, verse 9. And then he talks about the spirits of just men made perfect. So Hebrews 12, verse 9, God is the father of spirits. That means every human person originates from God. God created us. He creates the human spirit, right? Every human spirit. Hebrews 12, verse 9. He's a father of spirits. He's the one who creates every human spirit. 
But we also know that by default, people are sinful. So God created. God did not create the human spirit sinful. We created, so every baby that is example, every baby that is born, at some point when the baby is conceived, right? Or I, let me say this the moment the baby is conceived, we can say that the spirit is created. God creates because a, a person is spirit, soul, and body. You can't have a person without a spirit. So it has to be spirit, soul, and body. Now, the soul and the body is being formed, right? Like the slowly the brain is developing, the body is developing, but the spirit is created by God. He's the father of spirits. But when God creates, he always creates perfect. He won't create a sinful spirit. Right? So that means the moment the child or the baby is born, the baby is conceived, the spirit is created, is perfect. No sin. But at some point, okay, so there are two things. One is because all the human race, by default, after Adam sinned, the entire human race is subject to sin. By default, this baby is going to be subject to sin. By default, it's going to be. At that moment, it's not. It's still in the womb. So Psalm 51 verse 5, you know, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. That doesn't mean God created a sinful spirit. No, what God creates is perfect. But all of us human beings, by default, are subject to sin. So you must understand it in that sense. Not that God created the spirit sinful. No. What, whatever God creates is perfect. He's a father of spirits. But when the child is born, by default, being part of the human race, by being part of Adam's race, we are all under sin, subject to death, sin and death. Right? By one man, sin came into this world, and death through sin, and death passed on all men, for all have sinned. Romans 5, verse 12. So Psalm 51 verse 5 should be understood in the context of Romans 5.12. That means sin and death has come upon the human race. It's not the problem with God. It's the problem with us. But there are two things that we want to highlight. It seems to us, like I'm saying it seems to us because there's only one verse that we can point to. So I, I can't, you know, we can't say, oh, this is 100% correct. It seems to us that there is a stage, what we refer to as a stage of innocence. That means the human spirit is innocent. It doesn't know sin, not yet. We find this in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to 10. So let's go there. This is, uh, to my knowledge, it's the only passage that seems to uh, indicate this, right? So uh, that's why I'm saying, you know, uh, we, we can't, you know, we can't prove it like, or we can't say 100%. Yeah? This is what we think. So Romans 7, 7 to 10, uh, uh, somebody can read it, Romans 7, 7 to 10, please. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desires. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, 
since brain sprang to life and I died. Okay. So the key verses, verse 9. So Paul is describing his life under the uh, law. That means before he became a Christian, before he became a believer. So we know that for almost 30 years, first 30 years of his life, almost, the first 30 years of his life, he was living like a Jew under the law until he encountered Jesus. So he's living by the law. But he says this in verse 9, I was alive once without the law. Ah, so it asks, when was he without the law? Because technically all his life he was a Jew. He was under the law. So he explains. But when the commandment came, that means when he came of an age, when he understood the commandment. The law of God. Yeah. Don't steal, thou shall not steal, thou shall not covet, thou shall not, you know. So when he understood that, it made him responsible. Now you have to keep it. So when commandment came, then he says, sin sprang up and I died. That means I sin because I understood the commandment. Now I know. Uh, sin came into effect because I, I'm a breaker. I break the commandment. That means I'm under sin. So this is where we get the idea that he says, once I was alive without the law, before I understood the law. So that means that early stage of his life, uh, whether he up to seven years or eight years or sometimes 10, 12. Some people say 12 years old. They call it the stage of innocence right till pe the, the child understands the law what is right what is wrong okay they are in a stage of innocence right that's why when jesus you know little children come to jesus he doesn't say oh these are all sinners no they are born of adam's race they are all subject to sin but he says, you must be like them. You must be like them. So let the little children come to me. Because of such is the kingdom of heaven. So there is that we think. Okay. Again, I'm not saying this is 100% correct. We have only like one scripture or maybe two scriptures to give us this thought. So I'm not uh, saying, you know, we should don't preach it like oh, this is the only way. No, this is what we think, right? that God is the father of spirits. The moment the spirit is created, it's created perfect, created innocent, without the knowledge of sin, uh, and the child is growing. And at some point, um, the child becomes responsible. It comes to an understanding of what is right and wrong. Okay. What that correct age is, we don't know. Um, maybe, you know, whatever that age is. But when they understand what is right and wrong before God, then they become responsible. Okay? So that stage, till they come to know right and wrong, is called the stage of innocence. So that is why when somebody asks, you know, when a child dies, Will the child go to heaven or go to hell? Very difficult to answer. Because you say, okay, he, David said, in sin my mother conceived me. That means you're a sinner from birth. Yes, in what sense? We are born under Adam. We are born subject to sin and death. But the child has not done anything evil. The child itself has not done anything evil. In fact, the child does not understand, you know, one year, two years, three years. Uh, they don't have that understanding of the law of God. So therefore, I think it is safe to say that when children die below this particular age, they will go to heaven. 
because they don't they're not responsible they don't know the commandment the law of god uh, even though they are born under adam's race born under sin they are, they, they they don't know the law that's why we say again these are things we can't you know we don't want to fight about we can only say this is what we think uh, so we leave let god decide but this is what we think right so then what happens for all people for all people like like what we are telling is like uh, when we are uh, from our childhood we were sinners like it is because of adam mm -hmm. born under sin born under sin so everyone have to uh, i mean uh, when we are preaching also gospel in most of the places uh, most of the people will ask us why we are sinners like all the gentiles we are not sinners but we will like from our childhood because of adam said god so we are all sinners but but after after jesus christ came we were all forgiven right so can we can we consider it like this after jesus christ came to this on the earth all the people who were about to born after jesus christ were all forgiven not under sin not under any sin bondage of sin or any birth sin like that so uh, forgiveness comes after we have faith in jesus see it's like this jesus died on the cross and he paid for our sins people before jesus died on the cross had to have faith their faith was looking ahead so that's why romans chapter 4 it says abraham romans 4 i think verse 4 abraham believed god and it was he was made righteous so how was abraham made righteous jesus not jesus had not yet died on the cross how did he he believed god i mean he had faith in the future in god and what god would do for him in the future but that he had to believe god same thing we today also we have been justified by faith how jesus died on the cross he paid for us but we have to have faith so the payment is for everybody before and after for all sin but every individual has to have personal faith right so i can't have faith for somebody else meaning i can't say lord i have for my salvation and his salvation no that every person has to believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But has the payment been made? Yes. Right. So, so actually, this in the church has led to an error. It's called uh, universal gospel. I don't know whether we, we have a course on... Uh, I forgot. Oh, I think it was part of uh, apologetics. Uh, huh? So anyway, so uh, we talk about some of the wrong things. So in the church, I'm the church was a Christian church. Uh, in the 1900s, there was a uh, kind of theology called universal gospel the gospel the, the, what they were saying and one very famous american preacher i mean he had a big church uh, uh, this was in the 1990s he had a big church of more than i don't know 5000 people plus and he started preaching this but he was saying what he said was I mean, it's the argument seems very logical, but it is contradicting scripture. His argument was, Jesus died on the cross for every human being. Jesus paid for all of our sins. God will not allow such a kind of 
price to go waste by sending people to hell. Therefore, every person is already saved. This is called universal gospel. <laughs> but he started preaching like this. And he was part of the Pentecostal, uh, I think, uh, not so assemblies of God, but Pentecostal circles, that spiritual kind of thing. Then they, they, they dismissed him because they said, you're preaching heresy. But he was actually a very famous uh, pastor, very big church. Then lots of people left the church also. And then he had only 200 people or something. But this was suddenly started preaching like this. But it sounds very logical because Jesus died for everybody. He already paid everybody's sins, which is true. But the conclusion he came to was it's missing one important point, which the Bible says very clearly, every person has to believe. He jumped that point. He skipped it. <laughs> and he said, God will not allow such a great price to go waste. So every person is already saved. Whatever you do, you're already saved. Started preaching like that. Oh, full confusion. Because so he was such a famous pastor. Very influential. It was sad. Anyway. Um, yeah, so what we are saying is, going back to this, that there, there, there's probably a stage of innocence uh, where, or the, uh, some people call it the age of accountability, something like that. They use that term uh, based on the scripture. Romans 7, 9, um, that uh, uh, after that, after you cross that age of accountability, then you are responsible. Okay. So, now, once we cross that age of accountability, we are under sin. Okay, because we are breaking the commandment and we know it doesn't please God. We do the wrong things, we do wrong things, so we are under sin. We are responsible now for sin, for the works, for our deeds. Then, at some point, we are born again. Right? We receive Christ. Our spirit has been reborn. Sin has been forgiven. We are given the life and the nature of God. From that point on, Hebrews 9, uh, Hebrews 12, 23 comes into effect, where it says, um, Hebrews 12, 23, the spirits, he's talking about the church. What is the church, right? Hebrews 12, 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So he's talking about believers, us believers. We are the general assembly. That means the general gathering, assembly or gathering. We are the church of the firstborn, church of Jesus Christ. Firstborn is Jesus Christ, who are registered in heaven. So all our believers, we are registered in heaven. Our name is in heaven. To, the, to God, the judge of all. And then what about the church? To the spirits of just men made perfect. So the spirits of just men. That means people who have been justified, but we are being made perfect. So that is the spiritual condition of the church. The church is the assembly. It is the gathering of God's people. God is the judge. God is above us. We are the gathering of God's people. And we are people who have been made just. But our spirit is being made perfect. That means we are growing in our spirit. Right? So there is the state, God the Father, He's the Spirit, He's the Father of all spirit. Spirit is created. There is a stage of innocence. But then there is a stage of sin because we are all sinning. Then we are born again. Right? And then we are in that place where. We have been made just, but the spirit is also growing. It is being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are growing uh, in character and grace. Correct. 
Okay, so that's a good question, right? What about those who are just uh, maybe they're mentally, physically challenged, so they cannot understand, they cannot comprehend. What about them? Uh, we don't have a chapter and verse for it, but just going by okay, who God is? God is a good God, and He's a just God. So we just have to think, you know, how would God deal with a situation like this? We don't have chapter and verse. There's no chapter and verse that says, okay, if somebody uh, is, 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 you know, mentally challenged, not able to comprehend, they will go immediately be saved. There's no chapter and verse. We can't prove it from chapter and verse. The only thing we can do is try to think about the nature of God. How would God handle this? It's difficult because on the one side, God is a good God. God is a God of love. But on the other side, God is a God of justice. He's a God of truth. And what they are facing, it's not their fault, but it is a result of sin and uh, whatever the, you know, the, the fall and all of that. So how would God deal with this situation? We have to think. We can't give chapter and verse. <laughs> we have to base it on you know what we know about God. <laughs> they don't have the mind. Even if some people tell them it don't make sense to them. For them to connect, they won't, they're not able to comprehend, yeah. they won't understand it. So, can we uh, tell that because already, even if they did not confess and ask for forgiveness, but still, God, uh, Jesus paid price for them. So, God, look at Jesus on their behalf and forgive them. Can we say that? Um, yeah. yeah, so see, I, I I don't know whether we should apply the universal gospel because there is a flaw in that. The flaw is that they are skipping this important step in the gospel where it says you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So we shouldn't skip that step. Every person has to believe in order to be saved. What we are saying is, Because like innocent children, they're not in a place where they can understand the gospel. Therefore, they cannot believe. Therefore, God would forgive them. I mean, God would receive them into his care. We can say that, but again, we don't have chapter and verse to support. Right? We're only basing it on, like we think that this is how God would do it. Maybe. Pastor, uh, from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9, we have seen that God creates the human spirit and He is the Father of Spirit. And we also have uh, talked about that God uh, does not, God creates the spirit in perfect condition, like it's perfect. So, can we also like, uh, so is, it's not only during, uh, like my question is, like the spirit condition is perfect all the time, or is it only during the stage of innocence? Mm. So that brings us to our next point in the notes, which is once we go past the stage of innocence, the Bible says a spirit actually dies, it has death, which without the life of God. That means the spirit is in darkness. The Bible uses different terms. It is in sin, it is in darkness, it is in death, it is without the life of God. So that is the condition of the human spirit, of every human being after the stage of innocence. So 
can see that like the, the perfect nature of spirit that God created, God corrupted. God corrupted, that's right. So till the stage of innocence, right? From the time God created this, till the stage of innocence, till the 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 the, the, the understanding of the law of God uh, comes, till that. So Paul said, before the commandment came, I was alive. I think it was fine. Commandment came, I died. So he's talking about the condition of his spirit. Right? He was alive. So that's why sometimes even children are open to God. Uh, they may not understand everything. Uh, they won't understand the Bible, everything, but they open. You worship. Ah, oh, they lift up hands and worship. <laughs> Say praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> sing. They'll sing. This. Huh? Ah. So it is not that they fully understand, right? It's not the understanding the God's plan of redemption and salvation. Maybe they don't even understand. They're not in that stage. But they are alive to God. Something about them uh, makes them just worship God, you know, praise God, pray. They just come into it because their spirit is alive. But at some point, there is, the understanding comes oh, this is right, this is wrong, I have sinned against God. Then, when the commandment comes, sin revives. And I die, the spirit is dead. So that's the condition. So we look quickly. Uh, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Paul describes, you know, uh, what is the condition of the human spirit? Once sin sets in. Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3. Somebody can read it, please. And you, and you we may arrive, just as the others. Mm. So Paul, in these three verses, is describing our condition before we got saved. That means the condition of the human spirit in sin. So we were, so what were we, verse 1, we were dead in trespass and sins. So we were dead. Then he says, we were following the course of this world. That means we're following the patterns of this world. And the prince of the power of the air was at work in us. So can you imagine? What basically he's saying is, if we just make it plain simple, the powers of darkness was actually influencing our spirit. Because we were walking according to the course of this world. We were walking according to Satan, according to the prince of the power of the air. And the spirit of disobedience, that's the spirit that is working in the disobedience. So actually there's demonic influence directed towards our spirit. Okay. So we are dead. Our spirit is not connected to God. But our spirit, human spirit, is being influenced by the world, being influenced by Satan, uh, by the spirit's demonic powers, trying to influence our spirit. Okay, And then, verse 3, that's why we were living according to our flesh, desires of our flesh. And by nature, we were children of wrath. That means our very nature was wicked. And we deserve the wrath of God. So that was our condition. Uh, chapter 4, Ephesians, he continues. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. Again, he explains some more. Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. Somebody can read it for us, please. So I tell you this, and insist on it is in the Lord, 
that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hindering of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sexual sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity mm. with a continual lust for more. Yeah. So he's talking about the Gentiles, means people who are not yet saved. They are living according to their mind, the foolish thinking of their mind. But look at what he says about the Spirit, verse 18. The understanding is darkened. They are cut off from the life of God. They don't have the life of God. God's life, God's nature is not there. And they are ignorant because of the ignorance, blindness of their heart. Understanding is darkened, heart is blind, they are ignorant, they are cut off from the life of God. That is the condition of our spirit. Basically, we are in darkness, we cannot see, we cannot understand, and the life of God is not there. So, it is into this spirit, this kind of spirit, that is being influenced by demonic powers and so on, that the gospel comes. Right? So Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Then God who has who you know, God who brought light of the darkness, he has shined or he has shown into our hearts. So the gospel brings the light of God into this darkness that is in our spirit. And then we are born again. God, the life of God comes. Where there was no life of God, but we were by nature uh, children of Satan or doing wickedness. By nature we were like that. God's light comes and God's nature comes into our spirit. And then we are born again. So that's the next point, right? We actually receive the life and the nature of God. So our spirit was in darkness. Was controlled or influenced by evil spirits, uh, no life of God. Um, the light of the gospel comes. So let's just look at Second Corinthians four. Let's read that. Second Corinthians four, and uh, we'll read verses three to six. Second Corinthians four, verses three to six, please. But even if, but even if our gospel is valid, it is valid to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our heart, hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mm. Okay. So we are in blindness. But then what, what does God do? The, he shines into our hearts. The gospel, we, we preach the gospel, the light of the gospel comes, God shines into our hearts, and we receive the knowledge of God uh, through Jesus Christ. We are born again. Right? So when we are born again, what, what actually happens? Our spirit goes from darkness to light. It goes from being under the power of Satan. Now it belongs to God. It goes from being dead, that is, without the life of God, to a state of having the life of God. We receive, <coughs> sorry, we receive the life and the nature of God in our spirit. Okay, so the Bible says we are partakers of the divine nature. Second Peter one verse three. You can look at it. 
Second Peter. One verse three. We become partakers of the divine nature. Second Peter. As hmm. uh, as his divine power has given given to us all things that retain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Was for also please. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that though these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, you know, God, he has worked in us by his divine power. He has given us his wonderful promises. And as we receive that, what happens? We become partakers of the divine nature. That means God's life and God's nature is in you. The Bible says, he who has the Son has life. So Jesus Christ has come into your heart. Now you have life. So when we are born again, Satan's influence over our spirit is gone. We are no longer people in whom the spirit of disobedience is at work. Before Ephesians 2, we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit of disobedience was at work before. Now that's over. You cannot. You are a child of God. You're born of God. Your spirit is now in union with Jesus Christ and it belongs to God. You've been justified. And so things have changed. You have become a new man in your spirit. Okay, the life and the nature of God is in your spirit. Okay. So that transformation, the being born again, is an experience that takes place in our spirit. But our mind has to be renewed, our body has to be crucified. So that work still has to happen, right? But we are focusing now on the human spirit, what God does. Uh, let me just, so the last part here on page um, four, I'll just mention it uh, very quickly. But the human spirit must grow. You're born again. You receive God's life. You receive God's nature. You're in the light. You belong to God. Ch changes happen, but it has to grow. So if you look at scriptures like, you know, uh, uh, about growth, spiritual growth, Peter says, like newborn babies, you, you know, desire this pure milk of the word so you can grow thereby. Second Peter 3, 18, he says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. First John 2, 12 to 14, he says, your children, your young men, your fathers and mothers. So he's talking about spiritual growth. Secondly, the human spirit can increase in revelation knowledge. That means the, what the spirit knows, understands. Remember, before it was without understanding. Before it was darkened. Understanding was darkened. But now the spirit is in a place where it can receive revelation. God, I mean, God's knowledge, it can receive it. But it has to grow in that revelation. Okay? Uh, we have to know in the will of God, so the human spirit begins to understand what is pleasing to God, what is acceptable to God, is growing in the will of God. They can become strong. You can be strengthened, like Ephesians 3.16 says, we can be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. So Holy Spirit gives us strength. And many other areas that we can grow spiritually. Right. So as we move forward in this course, we're going to understand more and more about how to develop the human spirit. And it is a lifelong journey. You know, I don't think we can ever reach a stage where we say, ah, oh, enough, now I've reached. Paul wrote in Philippians 3, he says, you know, not that I have already attained. You know, I said, I haven't reached yet. Um, but I came moving forward. You know, so the journey is continuing. So we have to keep on going in that journey. So we'll continue this next week. Uh, we'll have some comments there about the soul and so on. Okay. I hear, the, I hear the bell ringing. All right. There are some questions in the chat. Probably I see your hand raised. 
um, during the stage of innocence, is the human spirit alive? If so, in what sense? Yeah, so the human spirit is alive. We saw in Romans 7 verse 9, Paul said, I was alive. So alive meaning open to God, open to, you know, that awareness of God. Of course, we're not, they're not able to understand everything. But like we said, you know, children, they worship God, they pray, there's that openness, uh, or a sensitivity to God. So in that sense, we can say it's alive. Probably your question. Hi, Pastor. Um, this is regarding, uh, we were talking about uh, mm -hmm. the children or uh, if, if they die, will they go to heaven or uh, something like that, where you clarified uh, uh, about that. But my question here is coming to adults. For example, uh, we see a lot of people who will be accepting Jesus uh, on their deathbed. Um, and uh, we believe whoever believes in Jesus and accept him will be, uh, you know, with him after their death. So, but I'm I'm not sure how how sure it will be because, uh, uh, as you said, we have they have to believe in their heart, but we don't know what exactly. Just saying a prayer doesn't mean that people really believe it. Um, so, just if you could throw some light on this, right. So uh, I think what we can say is, if they have made it, you know, even if somebody in the last minute genuinely repents and turns to God, they will be saved. Salvation is a matter of believing in the heart. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. So if they've genuinely believed in their heart, they will be saved. So that much we can say. Now, the, like as you pointed out, we don't know exactly the condition of the heart or what they've done, not done. That part only God can see and judge, you know. So that part, we should just leave it to God, uh, which we, which the, the aspect that we cannot see, we leave it to God and let God uh, determine that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll continue this next week. God bless. Bye.